Hello, this is Eric Strong again, and this is the second lecture in this course on antibiotics. In the last lecture, I discussed the classification of bacteria. In this lecture, I will go over which of those bacteria are responsible for each of some common infectious diseases. The specific learning objectives of this lecture are to understand the role of our normal flora, to be able to predict the most likely bacterial species responsible for an acute infectious illness, and to be able to discriminate whether a positive culture result represents a true pathologic infection or contamination. As I stated in the course introduction, this course is on antibiotics and not on the entire field of infectious diseases. So I won't be discussing any specific disease in detail, though I will spend a couple extra minutes at the end of this lecture on UTIs and blood culture contamination. As you are no doubt already aware, bacteria can be normally found nearly everywhere. They are on every surface we touch, every bite of food we eat, and even in every breath of air that we inhale. As a consequence, there are bacteria normally on us and within us. These bacteria have largely evolved a symbiotic relationship with their human hosts and are usually known as normal flora, or occasionally by the fancy sounding name, the human microbiome. The most obvious way in which normal flora contribute to our well-being is by serving as competition for invading pathologic bacteria and thus actually prevent infections. This effect is most readily apparent in the case of infectious colitis caused by C. difficile, which usually occurs when a patient has taken antibiotics that happens to kill off much of their normal colonic flora, but leaves the C. diff population intact and ready to procreate in the absence of other species fighting for nutrients and space. Other benefits of the normal flora include metabolizing otherwise non-digestible carbohydrates, and providing us micronutrients such as vitamin K and various B vitamins. Knowledge of which bacteria are normally found in certain regions of the body is helpful at distinguishing pathologic infections from non-pathologic situations such as colonization or frank contamination. There is no list both universal and comprehensive of normally present bacteria by organ as this varies from person to person and even may vary within the same person over time. However, here are some of the most uh, common members of the normal flora that are clinically relevant. On the skin, various staphylococcal and streptococcal species are present in great abundance, along with a collection of bacteria commonly called diphtheroids, which is comprised of the non-pathogenic members of the genus Carinibacterium. The GI tract is full of dozens of bacterial species or more. The exact composition uh, depends upon the specific location. In general, organisms which are universally present include many members of the Enterobacteriaceae family, such as E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Enterobacter, and others, Enterococcus, and various anaerobes, such as Bacteroides fragilis. Other organisms which may be part of an individual's normal flora in the GI tract uh, include staph species, yeast, and the pseudomonas. Within the respiratory tract, various staph and strep species are common, as is Neisseria meningitidis. That's right, the bacteria responsible for meningitis outbreaks. Yeast is also common in the respiratory tract. Unlike these previous sites, the urine and blood have no normal flora. Uh, although not listed on the slide, cerebral spinal fluid and peritoneal fluid are also two body fluids which are normally sterile. This explains why cultures of the skin, GI tract, and to lesser extent the respiratory tract are of limited utility, where cultures of these other sites, such as blood and urine, are critically important to diagnosing infectious disease. Before I get into the detailed specifics, there are a few very general rules as to what sites certain bacteria like to cause pathologic infections. Gram-positive cocci tend to cause infections of the skin, soft tissue, heart valves, lung, bone, joints, indwelling hardware like artificial joints, and indwelling lines like central venous catheters. Gram-negative rods tend to cause healthcare-associated 
hospital-acquired, and ventilator-associated pneumonias. They also tend to cause infections of pretty much any intra-abdominal organ and any organ of the GU system. Anaerobes cause lung abscesses and infections of the oral cavity, as well as pretty much any kind of infection in the uh, intra-abdominal space. And finally, atypical bacteria most frequently cause the atypical form of community-acquired pneumonia. Those were the very general rules to prepare you for a more complete list. I don't expect you to memorize this next slide, nor should you necessarily try to. I do hope, however, that for those of you who already have some clinical experience, the following will help solidify some of that experience into knowledge. So here it is, the master list of common infectious diseases and their common etiologic bacteria. Meningitis is caused by different organisms depending upon the age of the patient. There are various published breakdowns of prevalences by age, but in the most general sense, meningitis under one month of age is usually caused by group B strep, various gram-negative rods, or listeria. Between one month and 50 years, it is most frequently caused by strep pneumo and Neisseria meningitidis. And after 50 years, the most common etiologies are strep pneumo, listeria, and various gram-negative rods. In the lungs, there are many different types of infections. Pneumonia under one month is often caused by group B strep, listeria, enteric gram-negative rods, and staph aureus. Community-acquired pneumonia after one month is strep pneumo, H. flu, mycoplasma, and Legionella. Healthcare-associated pneumonia is caused by the same organisms as community-acquired pneumonia, plus staph aureus, enteric gram-negatives, and pseudomonas. Ventilator-associated and hospital-acquired pneumonias are caused by the above, plus the dreaded stenotrophomonas and acinetobacter. Aspiration pneumonia and lung abscesses are often due to anaerobes, Klebsiella, Staph aureus, and to lesser extent, Streptococci. Finally, empyemas, which are infections of the pleural space, are often caused by extensions of adjacent pneumonia and will therefore have the same pathogens. However, empyemas may also be polymicrobial, and co-infection with anaerobes is not uncommon. Diabetic foot infections, if the infection is superficial, it's usually due to staph aureus, beta hemolytic strep, and to lesser extent staph epi. If the infection is deep or associated with significant ulceration, pretty much any bacterial species can be involved, and these infections are usually polymicrobial, contributing to their extremely difficult to treat nature. Within the domain of uh, ENT or ears, nose, and throat, uh, when otitis media uh, is from bacteria and not from viruses, it is usually caused by strep pneumo, H flu, or Marxella. Otitis externa is from pseudomonas, staph epi, or staph aureus. And sinusitis, when not due to viruses, is often due to strep pneumo or H flu. Endocarditis and other endovascular infections are almost always from gram-positive cocci, including but not limited to viridin strep, staph aureus, enterococcus, staph epi, and strep bovis. Moving on to the gut, bacterial gastroenteritis is due to uh, often E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, and Campylobacter. A whole host of intra-abdominal processes from abscesses to cholangitis to diverticulitis share similar microbiologic causes, uh, including enteric gram-negative rods, pseudomonas, enterococcus, and anaerobes. And infectious colitis, that is infections of the large intestine, is most often uh, from C. difficile. Then within the GU system, UTIs and pyelonephritis, that is infection of the kidney, is usually due to enteric gram-negative rods, uh, enterococcus, and to lesser extent, staph saprophyticus. And pelvic inflammatory disease and prostatitis share relatively similar microbiologic profiles, which include gonorrhea, chlamydia, and the gram-negative enterics. I know that list was long, but there are just a couple more conditions. Osteomyelitis is most typically caused by staph aureus or group A strep. 
Septic arthritis can be caused by Staph aureus, Neisseria gonorrhea, if sexually active, and Streptococci. Cellulitis is usually due to beta hemolytic strep and Staph aureus. Be aware that this list is not all-inclusive and may vary depending upon what part of the world in which you are practicing. And while this list may help you to choose appropriate empiric antibiotic therapy while cultures are pending, there may be several other hints of the likely responsible pathogen. Some of these hints will come from the preliminary reports from the micro lab. Uh, if in a prelim report, which is essentially a statement the micro lab will put out before um, a bacteria has been fully identified, the lab re reports a culture is growing gram-positive cocci in clusters, it suggests staph. If it says gram-positive cocci in pairs and chains, it suggests strep or enterococcus. Gram-positive diplococci su suggest uh, strep pneumo. Gram-negative cocobacilli usually turn out to be H. flu. And lactose-fermenting gram-negative rods is a code phrase for E. coli, Klebsiella, or Enterobacter. In the event that one suspects a UTI, specific pathogens may be suggested by the urinalysis itself. For example, a positive nitrite test, which most clinicians don't even think about, suggests the responsible organism produces nitrate reductase, which reduces nitrates normally occurring in the urine to nitrites. These will include just about anything except Enterococcus and Staph saprophyticus. Because the urine needs to dwell in the bladder for some time before the bacteria have an opportunity to reduce the nitrates, a negative test has a low negative predictive value for ruling out a nitrite producing organism. In other words, a negative nitrite test can be seen with any bacteria, but Enterococcus and Staph saprophyticus rarely give positive nitrite tests. Another test result that can be helpful to see is a urine pH greater than 6.5. In the absence of alkalemia, this suggests the organism produces the enzyme urease, which catalyzes the hydrolysis of urea into carbon dioxide and ammonia. This ability is generally limited to Proteus, Klebsiella, and Staph saprophyticus. While I'm discussing UTIs, I want to give a word of caution regarding their diagnosis. In general, pathologic UTIs uh, are often overdiagnosed, as many people may have asymptomatic bacteriuria that usually does not need treatment. This most frequently happens in ERs and within tertiary care centers, where patients may be getting urine cultures checked with insufficient clinical suspicion to justify them. Features typically present in true UTIs include a positive urine culture, the usual cutoff used is greater than 100,000 colony forming units per milliliter of urine, but one should not be too dogmatic about this specific number if the rest of the presentation strongly suggests a UTI. Greater than or equal to 10 white blood cells per high powered field when a centrifuge sample is examined under the microscope, positive leukocyte esterase on dipstick, which is just a quick way of looking for white blood cells, and most importantly, symptoms, including altered mental status in the elderly or an otherwise unexplained fever. In the absence of symptoms, we generally don't consider a patient to have a UTI requiring treatment. However, there are three exceptions. Patients with asymptomatic bacteria who should be treated with antibiotics include pregnant women, patients about to undergo a urologic procedure, excluding routine catheterization, and patients who are unable to report symptoms due to abnormal sensation, as might be seen following a spinal cord injury, or due to altered mental status, as might be seen in dementia or delirium. I'd like to end this lecture talking about a common problem in antibiotic therapy how to identify a likely contaminant in blood cultures. Blood culture contaminants, that is, false positive cultures, result in significant excess healthcare costs and unnecessary antibiotic use. Factors that can influence the probability that a positive culture is the result of contamination include the pretest probability of bacteremia, 
when the expected prevalence of true bacteremia is relatively low, the rate of false positives will be higher. Next, the identity of the organism. A massive study of blood culture contamination at 640 different institutions identified these as the most common contaminants. Coag negative staph was felt to be a contaminant 62% of the time. Carini bacterium species, also known as diphtheroids, were a contaminant 73% of the time. Bacillus species, excluding anthrax, and Propionibacterium bacterium acnes were also commonly contaminants. Although these percentages are all similar, as coag negative staph grows out of blood many more times than these other species, of all positive blood cultures that are felt to be contaminants, the overwhelming majority are coag negative staph. Conversely, some organisms should never be assumed to be a contaminant when grown out of blood culture. These include Staph aureus, Strep pneumo, any member of the Enterobacteriaceae family, Pseudomonas, and although it's not a bacteria, uh, Canada albicans. Returning to this list, other factors that can influence the probability a positive culture is a contaminant also include the number of positive culture sets. The greater the number of positive sets, the less likely a contaminant. The time to growth. Several studies have shown that either bacterial growth occurring in less than a day decreases the chance of a contaminant, or growth taking over three days increases the chance of a contaminant. The final consideration is the institution-specific contamination rate, which can range from under 1% to over 6%. I wish there was a specific algorithm to follow or published Bayesian model that would help predict whether a positive blood culture represents true infection uh, or contamination. But unfortunately, to the best of my knowledge, there is not. As a consequence, one must use experience and gestalt. That concludes this lecture on the bacterial etiologies of common infectious diseases. I hope you found it interesting and useful and did not find the lists too overwhelming. Next, Lecture 3 will cover the basic mechanisms and classification of antibiotics.